So, so today, uh, I just wanted to start by kind of reviewing what we've seen so far and, and, and what we're going to do today. So um, over the course of these last three lectures, um, I've shown you uh, a little bit about the core of FSTAR itself and then focused on on three embedded languages inside it. We did this deep embedding of Veil assembly. I showed you how to shallowly embed uh, imperative lang languages with state, like um, both ML style state. And um, I gave you a demo of, of Lowstar and how you can do, um, you can model stacks and heaps and so on. Uh, um, and then we looked yesterday at Everparse, which is a language layered on top of Lowstar, a combinator language on top of Lowstar to do, um, to get uh, verified parsers. Uh, but all the languages I showed you so far have all been um, sequential. So we've only been doing proofs about sequential programs so far. And today I wanted to talk about um, concurrency. And that's this, this last piece here, this, this steel language. And um, I'll give you a flavor of what it takes to em embed a concurrent programming language and a concurrent program logic for such a language inside FSTAR. Um, so I'm going to switch to this presentation. Um, and it's an adaptation of a presentation from ICFP last year. And thanks to Emmerich from Hertz for uh, these slides. So, um, uh, so I assume at least some of you have seen a little bit about separation logic before, but I'm, I'm, um, I'm, I'll give you a very quick uh, primer about it here. So uh, concurrent separation logic is a, uh, a program logic in which to reason about um, uh, programs that manipulate uh, uh, resources of various kinds. They can be, these resources can be things like uh, a mutable state, but they could also be things like, I don't know, file descriptors or um, uh, uh, channels on which to exchange messages um, and uh, um, uh, yeah, uh, many kinds of resources, and to do, and it's a logic in which to reason about um, the programs that manipulate these resources in a in a structured way, where the where the logic and you know uh, allows you to describe sort of ownership on on resources and the way in which resources evolve. So uh, to give you a flavor of it, uh, it's a it's a whore style logic, and the main judgments in this in this logic are are whore triples like. Uh, like this, there's a there's a there's a program in the middle, um, a a a command or a sequence of commands that you're trying to ex execute, and the judgments in the in the system look like, under some precondition, you can execute a a program and um, um, and you will you can get this post condition as a result. Uh, there are several ways to interpret these triples, both in um, uh, a total correctness semantics and a partial correctness semantics. Um, and we'll look at some of the distinctions between that a bit today. But uh, the kind of um, uh, assertions that you, you get to write about uh, in a separation logic are things like this. Like, for instance, if I have a reference R and I want to mutate it by assigning V to it, then um, I can describe that using a triple that looks like this. It says, if I know that R in the initial state points to something, I don't care what it points to initially, I'm going to end in a final state where um, R now points to B. Um, and that's, a, hopefully, hopefully that makes sense. It's a, a kind of a simple triple for, uh, for writing. Um, but the main, sorry, the main um, distinctive feature about this, this logic is, um, so it's, it was a logic that was invented by um, John Reynolds, maybe uh, at this point, maybe 25 years ago, um, and then adapted for use in concurrent settings by uh, both John Reynolds and uh, Peter O'Hearn, and then and then many others. It's uh, this has been a very kind of active area of research for the last uh, twenty years or so. And one of the main distinctive features of this logic is that it comes with a, this a, a structural rule uh, called frame. And this this rule is kind of the essence of modular reasoning in separation logic. And what it says is that if I can if I have a triple P C Q, that means I can uh, safely run C in an initial state satisfying P, and I'm going to end in a final state satisfying Q. Then um, I can also run C in an in an extended uh, initial state where, in addition to P, uh, there is some other resource um, that satisfies 
this assertion f that is separate from p. It's disjoint from p. It's a, a separate resource from p, uh, the, uh, a separate resource that validates f, um, and it's separate from the resource that validates p. And I can execute c in this state, and I'm going to transform the resource that validates p to a resource that validates q while leaving the frame f unchanged. Okay, so th this provides a way to, um, to run a command uh, in, a, uh, in an environment where there is more stuff around, which the command is not going to touch. And if the command is going to focus its attention only on the resources it's going to manipulate and the rest of the world doesn't change. So, um, I, you know, for those of you who've seen this before, this is the, uh, I, probably what I've said now is, is not adding anything. This is probably very familiar to you. If you've not seen this before, um, I, I hope what I've said at least makes a little bit of sense, but it, it takes a little bit of um, uh, adjusting to understand what, what these things mean. So, so do ask me questions if you have any. I have a question. Yeah, about... uh, Nick, there's, there's one question. Yeah. So this the frame rule is it's essentially weakening, right? So it's making the precondition uh, bigger. That... Right. It's it. Yes and no. So, so there is. It is not exactly weakening because notice it's parametric in the frame. So there is a rule of weakening, often called the the rule of consequence, which allows you to strengthen the precondition and weaken the postcondition. Uh, and that is a rule that is also valid in separation logic. Um, but this rule is not is not that rule is not weakening. And what it's saying is the frame is is parametric you whatever initial frame you start with you retain that frame at the end so notice what happens is that uh, to see why this is not weakening notice that we have you could see that we have weakened the precondition like we uh, sorry we have strengthened the precondition we, we we needed to have p to run c well then it's okay to also have p star f but the weakening rule would would uh would force you to uh, weaken the post condition, but we haven't weakened the post condition. The post condition has is Q star F is stronger than Q. So this is a parametric rule. F is parametric. Does that help? Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah got it. I think. Yeah. I think it's right. Yeah, that helps. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, so the uh, so. One of the big insights in, in concurrent separation logic, something that was due to uh, Peter O'Hearn um, uh, and then uh, John Reynolds and, and, and Stephen Brooks and others in the uh, early 2000s, uh, they noticed that this structured way of reasoning about, uh, that was initially a logic for reasoning about things like um, mutable heaps in sequential programs, also applies to reasoning about um, concurrent programs. And uh, that the, the, the main rule that, um, that, uh, that you get in separation logic to reason about concurrent programs is, is this rule. It's if, I'm, if I have two commands, two programs, C0 and C, C1, and I wanna run them in parallel, it is safe to run them in parallel uh, under, uh, under these conditions. If each command, C, if C0 and C1 each operate on distinct sort of separate fragments of the, the resources, say they run on separate chunks of the heap. And if C0 transforms P0, if each of them, say take for, take for instance for I to be zero, if, um, if C0 transforms P0 to Q0 and C1 transforms uh, P1 to Q1, oh dear, I have a typo here. Uh, this, this should be a one, okay? Sorry about that. If um, if C0 transforms P0 to Q0 and C1 transforms P1 to Q1, then they are working on disjoint chunks of the resources. And what this rule is saying is that then it's, it's, it's safe to run them in parallel and they will transform the pair of initial resources of P0 star P1 to Q0 star Q1. Does that make sense? Yeah, uh, the, yeah the, there's one question. Uh, yeah. Does this have any relation to resource theory? Um, I'm not sure what you mean by resource theory. Uh, Sam, do you want to explain that? It's in chat. Uh, uh, 
And maybe you're talking about like resource analysis of programs and like, uh, you know, kind of computing, say computational comp complexity, like time and space complexity and these kinds of things. Uh, yeah, they say it's not, never mind, you can continue. Okay, uh, I think there, there are connections there, uh, um, but um, I'll, I'll, I'll move past it. Um, so, um, so, so, so we want a logic like this to reason about programs. Um, and it's th these kinds of logics have been very powerful and um, there've been many, many uh, extensions and adaptations and uh, uh, compared to the, the logics that were initially proposed in the 2000s, early 2000s, the separation logics that you have these days are way more, have many, many more features in them. Uh, uh, although their essence is still this kind of this 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 rule of framing is uh, still very much at the core. Um, so um, if you um, if you follow the lit the literature these days in 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 the the main PL conferences, you'll see a lot of work on separation logic. And uh, for instance, there's this there's this logic called Iris. That's um, a, it's a um, it's a very comprehensive, extremely expressive separation logic. That's uh, uh, in, it's a it's a you know uh, uh, for those of you interested in this kind of thing there's there, it's a it's a higher order impredicative um, separation logic embedded in Coq um, and it applies it, it, this makes it, it um, you know very powerful you can use it to reason about many intricate kinds of uh, concurrent and distributed programs people have formalized. Uh, paths of things like the Rust type system in in Iris. Um, uh, it's a, a rich area of research. Uh, but one thing that you, the way I, uh, these systems work, Iris in particular, is that it applies to Iris is this logical framework, and you can apply this logical framework to reason about programs. But the programs that you reason about um, in Coq are not actually Coq programs. They are deep embeddings of other programming languages in Coq. So, for instance, if you wanted to write a program in Iris to swap two references. Um, you could do such, a, uh, and, and you want to do a proof about it. it. The proof would roughly, the program and the proof would roughly look like this. And this is uh, taken from one of the IRIS papers. Um, you would write the syntax of the program that you're interested to verify as a piece of syntax in Coq. And, you know, you're, it would look something like this. You'd say, you know, there's a, uh, notice you're, you're building a program with strings and constructors and so on. This is just a piece of syntax. And it's the syntax of the program Lambda X, Lambda Y, uh, read X into some temporary, and then um, uh, uh, assign Y, uh, assign to X the current value of Y, and then assign Y the value of the temporary. And that's going to swap these two references. And to do a proof about, uh, about this swap, uh, you would write a proof in, um, uh, in Coq using the Iris uh, proof tools to, um, to, to describe a triple that looks like this. And the, the, the triple says, if I run swap on X and Y, then if I'm in an initial state where X points to V1 and separately Y points to V2, then what I end with is a program in a program state in which X points to V2 and Y points to V1. And you can, you can you, uh, you, you claim this, uh, this is the statement of your theorem. And then you can prove the theorem by applying the proof rules of, of Iris. So, um, so that's and so this is this is very powerful, and you can embed many different kinds of programming languages in Iris. And I encourage you to to uh, to uh, uh, go and learn more about Iris. It's uh, it's actually really cool. Um, I've, I've I've had a lot of fun uh, learning and reading about Iris myself. Um, but what what I want to do here is. Um, uh, I, I want to be able to use a, a program logic that is uh, approaching the expressive power of Iris, and I want to apply it to a full dependently typed programming language. I want to apply it to all of F star. I don't necessarily, I, I don't want to be programming in these, you know, in these small embedded lambda calculi. I really want to use Iris to reason about all of F star, and or, or, or logic like Iris. So what I want to be able to do is to write a program, my, the swap that I want to write. I want to write it like this. I want to say it's just a program in F star. It's a, it's a uh, function called swap. It takes two references, R0 and R1. It has an effect. 
it's it's in the effect st which may read and write the state and it may also in this case have uh, st I'm, uh, i'll show you i can also put concurrency into my particular st effect and the specification i want to write about it is that initially um, I, I have this assertion about my initial state r0 points to b0 and r1 points to b1 and the program is going to end in some final state where the uh, these points to assertions are flipped r0 points to b1 and r1 points to b0 and to write my program, I'm, I don't want to write deeply embedded syntax. I just want to write f star code that uh, reads a reference, uh, assigns a reference, and assigns the other reference. So I, I want to write full f star programs. And the way in which I'm I'm going to achieve this is, as you can guess, is I'm not going to use a deep embedding. I'm going to use a shallow embedding. And um, the the challenge that is going to that 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 presents is. You know, how am I going to model concurrency inside F star in a shallow way? Uh, and as in, how, in a way, I need to extend F star with a semantics for concurrency. And, um, uh, you know, how am I going to do that? And that's one of the things I'm going to show you today. And uh, the second thing is, well, I can give you a semantics for concurrency in F star, but I, as you, as I showed you previously, when I, when I described how to model state as a, uh, as a monad in F star, simply modeling the semantics of, of, of an effect is not enough. I want to use a refined effect to reason about the new uh, the new effectful semantics that I've ex that I've that I've defined in F star. So I, I want a way to enrich my semantics with a program logic to reason about uh, the the effectful programs that I'm writing. And I want to do this in the case of concurrency. I want to do this in a I, both in a total and a partial correctness setting. And actually, I, I am particularly interested in the partial correctness setting, where programs need not terminate. So many interesting concurrent concurrent programs are not designed to terminate. Um, uh, and Iris two is a logic for partial correctness. And, and in Iris, when you write a triple, um, this triple in in Iris, for instance, it means really that. Um, it, I can run my program in an initial state that that satisfies this assertion, and the program may not terminate. It may loop forever, but if it does terminate, then I get this assertion. So the semantics of these triples are in partial correctness, and I want to also have a partial correctness semantics um, for, for my programs. Um, so the the way I'm going to do this is um, is uh, in in a few steps. So uh, just to give you a, a a high level view of where this is going. I'm, um, I'm going to uh, uh, develop a notion of, of action trees or a, a kind of a, 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 um, a free monad representation, if you, if you will, of, of uh, computations, where I'm going to represent a concurrent computation as a, um, as a tree of, of uh, atomic actions. And I'm going to then, once I have a tree of atomic actions, I can interpret that tree in various ways including, for instance, in a non-deterministic interleaving semantics for, for atomic actions. Um, and that thing is going to give me a basis for describing what it means to have concurrent programs within F star semantics. Uh, once I have that semantics, I'm going to instantiate it with a, um, with a memory model on which I can describe uh, uh, separation logic assertions. And, um, and from that, once, once I've done that instantiation, I have a separation logic in F star for my programs, uh, for my concurrent programs, and then I can just start to build libraries. And I can build dependently typed verified libraries for things like locks and fork join concurrency and message passing concurrency and, and so on. And I'm going to give you a little tour of how that goes. Okay, so um, i switch to code now. Um, but um, I'm sorry, I'm time to pause for questions. Switch. Yeah, may I ask, uh, do you have a reference for a paper describing the section trees? Uh, yes, I, I do. So uh, so if you go to uh, my course notes, uh, I link there to, uh, so basically my, the content I'm gonna to present, today, present today is is based on two ICFP papers. There's a paper called Steel Core from last year. And there's a paper coming up this year uh, called Steel. And the Steel Core paper is going to describe, it, it's, it's a lot about these action trees. So uh, it's linked on the course notes. Thanks. Um, any other questions? Okay. No other questions. All right. So, um, uh, so 
uh, think of it this way. I, I'm going to have, um, the way I'm going to model a concurrent computation is as an, in an interleaving semantics for atomic actions. My, my, I have a, you know, um, uh, an atomic action is going to be, um, is, is the unit of my, of my larger computation in some senses. I'm gonna build things up, up out of these atomic actions. And an atomic action, what it can do is uh, it can read and write the state in a single atomic step. So think of an, ato an, an atomic action when I realize it on, a, uh, on, an, uh, on an actual computer, think of it as this is, I'm going to have an atomic action that's going to rep represent a compare and swap. And it's going, the, it's, the, the state it's going to read is gonna be a single memory location and it's going to return a Boolean to tell me whether or not the, the compare and swap, swap succeeded. And it's going to, uh, the final state is going to be um, uh, the effect of the, of the compare and swap on that one memory location. So this, is, this action here is my atomic action. It's going to be the, the basic type that I work with. So, uh, so uh, in this development, I'm gonna show you first just how to build a semantics for concurrency without giving it a program logic yet. And then I'm going to, I'm, as a next step, I'm going to show you how, for such a semantics, I can give it a program logic. Okay, so an action, uh, I'm going to do it parametric in the type of the state. An action is just a state passing function, and it's a, a total function from initial states to results and final states. Okay, now here's this next bit is I think the, the thing that you know um, uh, you, you'll need to wrap your head around to understand what it's representing. It's actually, I think, got some nice connections to the stuff that Patricia has been telling you about in um, uh, one of the other courses about uh, GADTs and semantics of GADTs and so on. So the way I'm going to represent my, my computations, my concurrent computations, is going to be as an infinitely branching computation tree. So uh, my type, this type, MSAN, is see it as the type of a, of, a, um, of a computation tree whose atomic actions are manipulating states of type S, this computation tree is going to result, return a result of type, N, of type A, and N, um, N is, is sort of less important. N is a way in which I'm going to, um, uh, in this particular setting, I'm gonna use N to count this, the depth of the computation tree. How, and I'm going to use this so that I can actually state a, um, a termination property over, over these trees. So n is less important, so, uh, um, but it's, uh, it's, uh, I need it as a technicality. Okay, so the representation of this tree is, um, uh, so I said, think of it as an infinitely branching comp computation tree. At, in the, uh, at the leaves of my tree, I have these return nodes. A return node is a, is a way where if I have a, 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 a computation that is kind of degenerate, it's already terminated and it's already given me an answer A, um, an, an answer X of type A, then I can promote this into a, a computation that um, is, a, is, um, uh, that is uh, that is going to return an A and uh, makes use of zero actions. It just immediately returns A. Okay, so that's the leaf of my tree. Now, I, what I want to represent is um, uh, this act node is kind of the, the, the main workhorse of this, re of this representation. Um, what I'm going to say is that over here is that if I have a single atomic action F, and this atomic action reads and writes the state S and returns a, a result of type B, and it does so in a single atomic step, then I can pair it with a continuation, that's the rest of the computation, that is going to read this, whatever the result uh, of the atomic action was, that's the B, and continue with the rest of the computation, building some other computation that's going to uh, read and write the state using multiple computation steps, but eventually returning an A. And if I have uh, this, uh, this action paired with a continuation, what I can get is a uh, computation tree that returns an A, which is the result of this action, of this continuation. And I'm going to account for the fact that, well, I at least did, I, I'm going to count the number of actions in my tree. So I, I have one action that was F and N actions in the continuation. So this tree has N plus one actions. Okay, so 
One way to think of this, uh, I've been saying that this is an infinitely branching computation tree, and it, it may take you a little bit to see why. So think of um, ret nodes as the leaves, and act nodes, um, they have an action, that's the, the payload of the act node, and they have, and then there, there, uh, there are um, potentially infinite children of that act node. And the infinite children are represented by this continuation. There is one child for every element of B. So for instance, if B were unit, then this, this, this act node would have only one child. If B were Boolean, it would have two children because there would be a one continuation associated with B equal true and another for B equal false. But if B were nat, then I really have an infinite number of children following the, the single action. So this is a, um, uh, so ret and act together make a, kind of an, inf an infinitely branching tree. Um, now, uh, the, the main thing I'm going to do to make this, to give this program a, uh, give this model a concurrent semantics is that in addition to ret and act, I'm going to main, have a, uh, another kind of node in my tree, which I'm going to use to represent parallel composition of computation trees. And what this is going to say is that if I have a, a, um, a computation tree M0 for the left-hand side of a parallel composition, and M1 for the right-hand side of a parallel composition, I can compose that with a, with a continuation that is going to, this is going to be the computation tree that runs after M0 and M1 have finished. So it's, think of it as a par followed by, um, uh, followed by a join of the two parallel computations that's going to run, uh, and the join is going to be followed by uh, a, a continuation for K. Okay, so that, I suspect some of you would have questions about this representation. Yeah, uh, so what does N stand for in, in this example? What does N stand for? Yeah, N number, N. N is, notice N is an, um, remember we saw on the first day, we saw this, uh, or maybe it was the second day, this, this type of vectors where I was using this index on, on vectors to, to, uh, to compute the size of a vector, the length of a vector. Well, this N is simply computing the number of actions that appear in a tree. So in the case of RET, uh, this, the N here uh, uh, is zero because there are no actions in the tree. Um, in this case, if my continuation has N actions, then um, pairing an action with my continuation has N plus one actions. Okay, okay. Okay, uh, so uh, there's another question. Uh, can you please repeat the description of uh, par or par, the third uh, type constructor? So, uh, so I want a way to represent. Let's say I I I, I want to run computations that look like. Let's say I, I want to write. Uh, I hope this notation is clear. I want the, my intention is to write uh, computations that look like this. I want to run e one and e two in parallel. And once E1 and E2 finish, I want to continue with running E. So I'm sequentially composing um, the parallel composition of E1 and E2 with E. Okay, so the way in which I'm going to represent this is that, let's say, so E1 is a parallel, is going to have type M, S, A, 0, N, 0. Uh, E2 is going to have type M, S, A1, N1. And E is going to have type M S A N. And to represent this, I'm going to I'm going to write it as a par of that, that, that. Okay, where uh, does that make sense? That's and, and this guy E1 is going to be, maybe if I rewrite the names, E1 will be M0, E2 will be. M1 and E will be K. And I've, okay. and I've left out the other implicits. So uh, the other indexes, uh, they can be there. Yeah, they're implicit. Does that help? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so there's, uh, okay. So there is another question. Uh, why do we need to add one at the end? Uh, somebody's asking. Uh, Oh, why do we need to add a one at the end of this? Uh, it's a good question. Um, I'm, 
uh, I'm going to use the one uh, right. That's it. that's actually uh, I, I realized that what I I, um, I, I said was uh, was slightly inaccurate. So I, I'm going to count this n is going to count the number of actions in the tree, but it's it's actually counting the number of constructors in the tree. That's maybe more accurate. That's it's uh, it's also counting the number of power nodes. If I didn't have the power node, it would be counting only actions. But once I add the power node, I'm also going to count the number of power nodes I have in the tree. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So uh, there's there's another question. Uh, why does K not consume the result of E1 and E2? Here, right? In 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 par. Uh, yeah, I'm. Uh, I think. Yeah. Yeah. In par. Yeah. So there's there there's a um, there are many choices here for how to represent. Uh, um, uh, K. Uh, so what I uh, so one thing I did was I wanted to represent it this way, right? Or maybe I'll write write it using. Um, so I I chose to represent it this way, where K does not actually consume the result of M zero and M one. If K, uh, but I, I think what the person is asking the question is saying, why could you not, for instance, say let X zero X one equal m0 m1 in k of x0 x1 oh. right why not let the let the continuation consume the results of, of, yeah. of m0 and m1 and you can do this if you want uh, it turns out to be an, an, uh, uh, in our uh, ICFP paper actually we show we have a representation that does this that actually lets the continuation con consume the results of x0 and x1 but I've since since then I have I have um, I have uh, I think this is this is actually redundant and adds more complexity than is needed, because one way in which you can encode this, uh, so it, my semantics my representation here is simpler than this. It, the K does not consume the results, but if I want to encode this, I can because one way in which I can do it is I can uh, I can allocate a piece of state for both M zero and M one. M0 and M1 can write their results into that piece of state. And K can simply read from that piece of state. So I can use the state to encode this kind of dependency uh, of, on, the, on the result rather than having it uh, uh, be baked into the structure of the computation. So uh, this is expressible, but uh, using an encoding. OK, OK. Uh, yeah, so there's another question. Uh, how was it modeled that K happens after M0 and M1? Right, right. Uh, so right now it isn't. So so what I've uh, given you here is just a uh, a representation for my computations. I have not yet given it a semantics. I'm going to show you the semantics in a second, and the semantics is going to const is going to give it that interpretation. So right now there there that has not yet been specified. Okay. Yeah. Th those are the questions. Okay. Great. Nice questions. Thank you. Um, so the way in which I'm going to Give a semantics for these computation trees is to actually define a um, a uh, an interpreter for for these computation trees, and this interpreter is going to um, uh, the the tree represents the the skeleton of the computation, including all these par nodes. And the main thing that the interpreter is going to do is it's going to non deterministically interpret the par nodes. So it's going to you know every time it encounters a par node, it's going to sample a boolean. A, a, a boolean from a random from a tape of booleans uh, and 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 then decide whether it's going to evaluate an action on the left of the par node or the right of the par node okay so that's the that's the main idea of the of the interpreter so um this interpreter i'm, I'm going to structure it in in two steps i'm going to give a single step interpreter and then i'm going to close over it and give a, a multi-step interpreter okay so um, here's the, the, the type of my single step interpreter. It's a, uh, it's a recursive function. It says, if I'm given a, a, a computation tree F that's uh, uh, in uh, M uh, manipulating states of type S and returning an A and the size of the tree is N, then if I'm given an initial state S and a, um, a source of randomness, this uh, tape of booleans, uh, and I'm, uh, I'm also going to have an index i, which is my position in the tape. Then step is going to, in, is a pure computation that's going to take a, a single step and it's going to return a step result. 
Um, and a step result is going to be just a, um, it's a reduct of this. I just, I, I packaged it up in, a, in, in another type. What it's saying is it, I get a reduct. That's the, that's the result of evaluating F by one step. I get the next state of the computation. Every time I evaluate the state, uh, evaluate a computation step, the state might change. So this is the next step of the, of the computation. And um, I may have advanced my position in, this, in the stream of booleans. And this NAT is going to tell me what, how far I've, I've, I've advanced my, uh, uh, in, this, in the stream of booleans. So this, the, given a step, I return a step result. I can always run this. I have a trivial precondition. Um, but my post condition says that either I have terminated, in which case my uh, um, result, step result node the reduct is just a, the return case. I don't have any more steps to take. Or um, I can prove that this, that this, um, this uh, size index n is of the reduct is smaller, strictly smaller than the, uh, the size index of my input computation f. Okay, And I'm going to use this, this uh, strictly smaller thing to show that I can compose multiple steps of uh, reduction to get a big step uh, reduction semantics. So um, the way I'm gonna do this to, to define this interpreter, it's, it's actually fairly simple. So, um, so if I'm in the, if I already have a return node, the computation F is already terminated, there's nothing to do, just return the, the, we don't take a step, we just return the same computation back, the state didn't change and my position in the tape didn't change. But if I have an action node, what I'm going to do is, so this is, the, the computation tree is telling me, the structure of the tree is telling me that I have the action node, I must evaluate that guy first, get its result, and then I can evaluate the continuation. So, uh, so that's what I'm going to do. I have my action node, I'm going to run it on my, in, on my initial state S, and it's going to return to me some result B in the next state. And I'm going to continue that with my, my reduct is going to be uh, applying the continuation to the result B. So this is kind of going to choose, if you see K as a, um, the, the children of this action node, K of B is going to choose which child I continue with. So it chooses the, the child I'm going to continue with, and that's the, uh, the, uh, the step of reduction. The state changed to state prime, and um, I didn't use any randomness yet. So I just didn't change my position in the tape. Okay. Um, so if so, I'll let me pause here for a second. If you understand this much, then like this is basically a classic kind of free monad semantics for state, um, an interpreter that's giving a st um, stateful interpretation to a free monad. I, I don't, um, now we're going to get to the concurrency part, but I don't know if you need any questions up to this point. Uh, no, no questions. Okay. So, so now I'm going to hit a, a, a par node, and uh, and here I have some. Um, uh, here's where things get a bit interesting. So, um, if my if the first computation, so I have a par of uh, an m zero and an m one with some continuation k. If m zero has already terminated with the return, then I, then I, there's nothing I can do with m zero. I need to evaluate m one. So if if um, uh, so, then I I go and evaluate m one. If um, uh, if uh, uh, if M one has terminated and M zero has not, then that's fine. I can go and evaluate M zero. But now here's where things get get interesting. Let's say neither of them have fully reduced yet, um, and I have some. Uh, so so then I have to decide which on which side I'm going to descend to pick the next action to evaluate. And the way I'm going to do it is that the, these two sides are actually symmetric. So what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to break the symmetry by sampling a Boolean from my tape. I'm going to um, yeah, sample a Boolean, and the Boolean is going to tell me which side I'm going to go. And if I, if I get true, I'm going to go on the left, and I'm going to recurse by taking a step in M0, having advanced the tape to I plus 1. And that's going to tell me how I reduced. It takes a single step in M0. And then I return by just packaging up whatever the reduct was of M0, M0 prime into the par node and I return, and the other side is, is, um, is symmetric. Now, uh, so having shown you how I resolve the non-determinism, let's say, you know, if, um, 
uh, if um, here in this case, if the left hand side has already reduced to result, then I take a step on the right hand side. And if the right hand side has, al has also reduced to a result, then I can just, you know, um, I, can, uh, I can continue with uh, the continuation K. And this is the thing that's going to enforce that K runs after both M0 and M1 have terminated. So that I think hopefully answers a question from earlier. This thing is what is uh, constraining K to be sequentially composed with the parallel composition of M0 and M1. Okay, so now that's my single step interpreter. Now I'm going to compose this into a multi-step interpreter. And the way I'm gonna do this is by, um, by adding a top level run that's gonna say, well, uh, it's gonna run this computation F. And if F has, uh, has already terminated, that's fine. I can just return it. Otherwise I take a single step, I get some reduct and I can recurse. And this recursion is well-founded because my, I've get, been careful to show that at every step of reduction, if the thing is not a return, then um, n has decreased. So then F star can prove that this run is actually total. Okay, so that's so so that's uh, the the kind of punchline of 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 this uh, of this bit first development. It's saying I, I gave a representation to my computation trees, to, to my concurrent computations as computation trees. And now I gave it a semantics that's that's the interleaving semantics for uh, atomic actions over these trees. Okay, and it shows that I can, uh, given one of these trees, I can interpret it uh, as a state arrow tape arrow position arrow result cross state. Now, so so that's my this type is my semantics of these these computation trees. M. Um, questions. Yes, there is one. Uh, this provides semantics for cooperative concurrency, right? Uh, uh, yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, so, uh, uh, I'm trying to understand what the question means. It's uh, um, it provides semantics for that, uh, at least that. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, I. I is that what you meant, Mayank? Or, or do you want to ask the question again? Okay. It, it provides uh, yes. interleaving semantics of, of atomic actions. Yeah, I was just wondering if uh, we could provide semantics for uh, uh, you know a non cooperative as well in some way, um, like the threading. So this this is it. So. Um, this this is thread so this is my model of threading so i'm saying e1 and e, uh, m0 and m1 evaluate in separate threads but there's an interpreter that is going to give them uh, a uh, and it, it's an interleaving semantics of the atomic actions evaluating in separate threads this is that that's my um, th that's my uh, uh, okay. that's my model Right. Okay. okay. So, so uh, okay. Is there another question? Yeah, there is one question. Uh, the comment says uh, we instantiate the frame, extending it to include the precondition of the other side of the path, but we haven't actually included preconditions in the type yet, right? Exactly. I'm going to show you that next. This this is not. I have not yet given you a program logic to reason about these concurrent programs. You can just. At this point, you can just run them. Okay. Okay. So uh, another question: uh, Is there a reason we didn't define a big step interpreter here? Yes, that's a good question. So why did we not define a big step interpreter in, in one go? Um, um, we there there are ways to do that. So, the, but I prefer to not do it here because what I'm doing is that um, the the computation tree is representing my evaluation context. So the entire tree tells me the, the structure the, the, the structure of the entire uh, computation. And I'm going to, every time I take a step, I'm gonna take a step in that tree and then rebuild the entire tree. That's what this, this, this step is doing, right? It's rebuilding the tree as it, as it, as it, uh, as it returns. And 
that tells me what my evaluation context is at, the, at every time so that at the next step of reduction, I can again descend into the right point of the, of, of the tree, the, um, potentially a different point in the tree because at, at each time I hit a par node, I'm, I can non-deterministically go to either side. And um, I, so I'm, I'm encoding the evaluation context in the tree. Okay, okay. Yeah. There is there is one more question. Yep. Uh, what does it mean to have an interpreter that generates a trace non-deterministically? Does that mean two runs of the interpreter on the same program would lead to different outputs? Yes, they can. That's right. So the the interpreter is uh, uh, is non-deterministic. It take it's it depends on the state of booleans, and the result of the interpreter is is uh, uh, I mean I've, I've resolved the non-determinism by providing a tape. But uh, for different tapes, the, the interpreter can produce different results. And that's by design. OK, great. Thank you. Um, so, uh, so a quick interlude before I, I, uh, I was wondering if I would get a question about this. But, uh, uh, but before jumping to, to, to show you how to enrich this thing with a program logic, I'm, you know, what I've done here is I've um, I've given a uh, an interpretation of this of this computation tree into this type state arrow bools arrow pause arrow a cross s. Now this whole thing is a in itself a state monad. Why did I just you know it's why did I bother to thread these things through by hand? I should have programmed this whole thing inside another effect in S, in F star, right? So um, so I can do that. I can, if you wanted to, uh, uh, so, um, so I, one thing you can do is to define in F star a semantics for just non-determinism in state, excluding concurrency. And I can say, I have a, 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 a program representation, an effect representation that is only for non-determinism in state, that's taking a tape, a position in the tape, an initial state, returning a, a result, a uh, final state, and a new position in the tape. And this is, this is an effect in F star that I'm going to call NDS for non-determinism in state. And it has three actions, get, put, and sample. And, um, uh, and I can then write a, I can write my previous uh, uh, interpreter, not in tote, but I can write it in NDS. And then that cleans up things a lot. I don't have to bother with incrementing these sample, these positions in the tape or threading the state through and so on. I can just, instead of interpreting these things in tote, I can interpret them in NDS. And, um, and that cleans up things. I can, I can use put and I can use, uh, I can use sample directly rather than having to thread through this, this tape and so on. So you may be curious to see that. That's an, an instance of layering effects on top of each other. Um, but um, I kind of, uh, I, I chose to, to do it this way uh, to sort of make it explicit to you um, how the state and the sampling and stuff is going on rather than to hide it behind an effect. But you can hide it behind an effect if you want. Okay. So now, um, as uh, some of you already observed, like I, I, I have a, a semantics, but I don't have a logic to reason about uh, these concurrent programs yet. And let's see how you can, you can get a logic to reason about them, a separation logic to reason about them. So, um, that's this next development. And I'm going to do two things in this development. I'm first going to, um, th there's, there's two goals here. So, so I'm going to enrich the, the, the semantics with, a, um, uh, with, this, with the separation logic. But in doing so, I'm also going to move to a, to a partial correctness setting. I wanted to give you guys a taste for, uh, uh, for the effect of divergence in F star. So um, we've seen effects like state and uh, uh, even NDS, which I showed you just now. Well, F star has another effect, a, a primitive effect in F star called div for divergence. And programs that are written in the div effect need not terminate. And uh, they, because of F star's effect system, these, as I, I've mentioned a few times, you cannot, the only things you can write in specifications, in refinements and so on, are um, total F star terms. So these divergent F star computations are are isolated from its logical fragment. You can write divergent computations, but you cannot compromise F star's total core with them because the effect system keeps them separate. So I'm going to use divergent computations 
and I'm going to then derive a, a logic for partial correctness on top of potentially divergent semantics for these uh, uh, action trees. So the way I'm going to do that is I'm I'm going to um, uh, first um, now I'm going to do this generically. I'm going to do it for uh, a a class of separation logics um, rather than picking up any given separation logic. And the thing that I that I want my abstraction of a separation logic that I'm going to choose here is going to be really simple. I'm going to say in order for for my semantics to be usable with any separation logic, I need to have a commutative monoid over some state. So I have some representation of a state, S. S can be, think of it as S can be my heap. I want some notion of assertions on that heap. And that the type of those assertions are going to be of type R. And think of these assertions as, you know, the, the P star Q and so on that I had on my slides. Those assertions are going to be taken from this type R. And I want two, at least two kinds of assertions uh, in R. I want a, an assertion called M. And EMP is going to say, like, I don't have, EMP is the unit of this, uh, of this commutative monoid. It's going to say, I, um, when you assert EMP about the state, it means that you have no knowledge about the state at all. Okay. And I have, some, I have a star, which is a, a way to combine uh, two assertions, two separate assertions. This is going to be the way I write P star Q. And I want a way to interpret an assertion as a, and interpret an R assertion as a predicate on S's. So there's a way to take an R and get an S arrow prop. That's my interpretation. And I want all of these to satisfy some laws that's gonna make this thing a commutative monoid. It needs to, the star needs to be associative. It needs to be commutative. And M has to be a unit for star. And this is my abstraction for a separation logic, okay? Um, uh, please interrupt with questions. Um, so, um, so now, um, yep. Yeah. The, the third one, interrupt, interpret, what mm -hmm. was the meaning of, of, means I understood M and star, I didn't understand interpret. So interpret is gonna be, if I'm given an assertion R, like say I had uh, my, uh, in my points to assertion that I use on my slides, I have R can be an instance of, you know, um, uh, something like my reference X points to 17, that can be an R. Given such an assertion, I want to interpret it as a predicate on a heap, the S arrow prop. So it's a function from R to S arrow prop. And as our prop is a predicate on the state. So it's going to say, well, this means that if I select location X in the heap, the value that I get out of it is going to be 17. That's going to be an interpretation for an R. Okay, thank you. So, uh, so, uh, so now, um, whereas previously, if you remember what, what we had with actions was that my actions were just S arrow A cross S, right? But now I want to, I want to make this, I, I want to uh, enrich my actions with specifications. So my type of actions now is going to be a little bit fancier. My type of actions is, is going to be the, the main idea in this semantics, which I, you know, um, um, uh, my colleague at, at Microsoft Research in Cambridge, Matt Parkinson actually uh, suggested this to me some time ago and uh, uh, thanks to him. So um, the main, the way in which I'm going to represent actions is, um, is as um, every action is going to be um, frame preserving. So what this says is that the way I'm going to represent an action is, is if you give me a frame, that's an element, that's an assertion in my uh, separation logic, a C dot R, and you give me an initial state that satisfies some precondition and the frame separately, then the action is going to return to you a result A and a final state uh, S1, such that I get the post condition of the action, that's this post condition, but I also keep maintain the frame about S1. And this is, this is kind of one of the, the main ideas of the semantics. My actions are, all my actions are going to be frame preserving by construction, okay? So the main goal of the semantics will then be, if every individual action is frame preserving, can I prove that, uh, the entire computation tree is also frame preserving. So, uh, so that's gonna be the main work here, like lifting the frame preservation of individual actions to the entire tree. Okay. Now the, the, the rest of this, this uh, my, my representation here is, um, is kind of the same as before. So I still have a ret node, but the main thing here is, so there's two things that have happened or maybe three. So first 
I, as I mentioned in the beginning, I'm, I'm, I've now moved to a partial correctness setting. I'm not going to worry about proving things terminating. So I got rid of that N index because that thing was there only to serve uh, for a termination proof. The N index is gone. But the more interesting thing that has happened is that whereas previously I had my, you know, in, um, my types were of the form uh, in partout, I had M S A N in partout. Um, um, here in this development, I'm my my types are of the form n. I've made s and uh, I have a new index c for a commutative monoid. That's my language of assertions. Uh, I've made s implicit. I have a new index c. I'm going to have a, which is my result type. But now instead of n, uh, I'm going to have a precondition and a postcondition. Okay. So my my trees are going to be indexed by uh, uh, separation logic assertions. Okay, so this is kind of a, 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 a kind of a, a pretty rich GADT where I'm uh, I'm indexing my indexing structure is um, our assertions from some separation logic. Okay, so um, that's in this uh, here. I have my 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 trees look like that. So. Um, so this, the indexing structure on these trees, they are going to state what my separation, my separation logic rules really are. So for instance, if I have an A, if I'm trying to return an A as a computation, then it's uh, this, the result type of, of this constructor is going to tell me what the interpretation of a return is in my separation logic. It says, well, if I wanna prove some post condition about my uh, atomic result, A, then it's the precondition for that is you better prove the post condition about the result post uh, about X. So the precondition of post is post X. Okay. The, now the action node, the action node is, is again, it's got an action and it's got a continuation and the continuation is going to be indexed by the result of the action B. So it's the same kind of infinite branching structure. But now notice that because I'm in a partial correctness setting, I'm going to allow, this is the divergence effect that I mentioned earlier. I'm going to allow my continuations to diverge, that they're they are allowed to diverge if they want to. Uh, but uh, if, uh, if they return successfully, they are going to return a computation tree, which uh, if in order to establish the post condition uh, that you're interested in, their precondition must be the post condition of the action that was run previously. So this is kind of a, 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 um, a chain rule in some sense. It's saying, if I want to prove some post condition uh, and I want to get the precondition as the precondition of my action F, then I have to be able to prove that the post condition of the continuation is the post condition of the action. Okay, so you can stare at that for a bit. It's a, it's a rule of sequential composition. And uh, and now the power the, the power constructor is going to um, is going to uh, is going to capture the rule the power rule from separation logic. So here uh, I'm going to constrain my results of the notice that you know I, I said earlier that I have uh, I'm going to write m0 m1 semicolon k. So um, what I've done here is uh, I've actually constrained the result types of M0 and M1 to just be units uh, because I'm not going to read their result anyway. So I've constrained them to be units and it, they actually need to be a unit in an appropriate universe in this universe A, that's a technicality. So I have to be, they return a unit in the appropriate universe. So, um, uh, but, but what this is saying is that if I have uh, my par node, if I want to prove a post condition about my par node, then the continuation that this k that's running at the end, uh, it has to establish this post condition from a precondition that is the separate preconditions of, of, uh, of M0 and M1. So M0 has to establish post zero, um, M1 has to establish post one. And if the continuation can establish post from that, then the par node followed by the continuation can establish the post from an initial state that satisfies the preconditions separately of M0 and M1. Okay, so these three things have expressed the rules of my separation logic, the base rules of my separation logic. Okay, uh, happy to have a question. If, yeah. if... Uh, Nick, so there is one question. Uh, can you say a bit more about why we want K to be allowed to diverge? 
Right, so, uh, so I'm interested here in a partial correctness semantics. So for instance, I'm going to allow you to, um, I, I want to be able to use my semantics to implement things like, let's say a spin lock. So what is a spin lock? A spin lock is going to, I'm, I'm going to write a library that says, I have an atomic action that's going to um, use a, um, a compare and swap instruction, some atomic instruction to implement a lock. And what this, the, the way in which I'm going to implement this lock is I'm going to, um, uh, I'm going to, it's a spin lock, right? So I'm going to uh, repeatedly check if the, if the, some bit in my, uh, uh, is, is set using a, uh, using a CAS. And if it's not set, I'm going to keep looping. And then uh, until I get the chance to set it, and then if I can set the, uh, the bit and then I can exit. But I, I need to be able to loop potentially infinitely waiting for this, uh, this lock to be released. So I want a semantics in which I can implement such things. So, um, so I want divergence. So that's why I'm going to allow my continuations to diverge because I, I want to write programs like spin locks. Okay, yeah, that, that satisfies it. Yeah. Then no more questions. Okay. Uh, so now what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm, I'm going to impl uh, implement a, a single step interpreter followed by a multi step interpreter. And it's going to look uh, similar to before, except now the whole thing is going to be done with specifications. And now the type of my, uh, my single step interpreter is going to say if I have an M, that's that satis that it satisfies the triple pre post um, that transforms a, a state from a, a assertion uh, uh, from a state satisfying pre to a state satisfying post and i'm given a frame and some initial state then if the initial state satisfies pre star frame then i'm going to get a step result and the way i've done it is that inside my step result i'm going to say that uh, I get a new state where I continue to satisfy a frame, but I satisfy some other predicate P that's the, the, uh, the precondition of, this, of the reduct, okay? And I can, the structure of the interpreter is, is just the same as before. I'm going to, if I return, there's nothing to do. If it's an action, I just take the step of the action and continue with the, the continuation. Um, the par node, maybe it's, it's structured slightly nicer here, I would say. It's if both sides have returned, then just go for the continuation. Otherwise, step on both sides uh, and just step on either side by deciding uh, which side to go by sampling a Boolean. Okay. And the, the, main, um, the main punchline from this is that I can now turn this into a top level interpreter that says if I have a pre and a post, a, a computation satisfying a pre and a post. I can run it in a state S, so long as S satisfies pre, I can end in a state where S satisfies, uh, the final state satisfies post, okay? So now I have a, a run that has the type that I want. It, it, it now tells me, uh, it gives me a, like a whore specification for my, um, uh, for my concurrent computations. Um, I can actually prove, uh, so, so, so what I'm going to do at this point is now I, I want to now package up this 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 uh, uh, this representation into an effect in F star so that I can actually start to write effectful programs against the semantics. So to do that, I need to, um, as we did before for uh, our state monads and so on, I need to package this up as a um, uh, as a type that supports a return and a bind. So I can do a return easily. A return is just a. Um, uh, is is just a um, um, is just the return node of of uh, of the computation tree, and it has a type that looks just like the return node of the computation tree. Notice that this thing M is not strictly speaking a monad, right? It's got these additional indexes that don't behave like a monad. It's actually, if you if you, um, it's something that you could some people call like a, a dependent parameterized monad. This thing does not satisfy yours. There's some questions about this. This thing does not satisfy your, your uh, you cannot state the classic monad laws about this structure. There is some other uh, variant of the monad laws that apply to this structure. Um, and you can also, uh, to define a bind uh, for, for the structure, I need a way to take an, an, an N and compose it with a continuation that is going to uh, transform a, a, uh, an M of A into an M of B but while paying attention to my, my indexes. 
so that I can I can chain the indexes. If I'm going from if f goes from p to q, and g goes from q to r, I can compose these things and go from p to r, and I can implement such a bind by essentially traversing the tree and sticking the con the continuation g into the right part of the um, of the tree. So uh, I keep descending into the tree and put the continuation right at the end. Okay, and so I can define a bind for it, and and then here's the, the, the main, one of the main punchlines for the semantics is that this semantics admits the frame rule. And here's my proof that I, I can actually get the frame rule out of the semantics. It says, um, if I have an N A P Q, then I can, um, using this combinator, treat it as an M A P star frame to Q star frame. Q of X for the result X. So this is my frame rule. And I can prove basically that since my actions, my leaf actions are all self-framing, they all individually preserve frames. I, this accommodator here shows how you can lift the framing of individual actions to the framing of the entire tree. So that's, that's kind of, now I have a separation logic that I want. I have, I have frame, okay, is that, um, and I also can, par is easier. Par is just the par node that I already built. Um, is there a um, question about that? Yeah, uh, uh, not about that, but uh, there is there are a few questions. Yeah. So, uh, can we assure divergence for programs that should run forever? Uh, can, we... can we ensure divergence of programs that should run forever? It's an interesting question. Um, uh, not an F star, no, not that I know of. There may be some way, but I, off the top of my head, I think the answer to that question is no. Is it not okay. it just a post condition false that doesn't work? Ah, post condition false, interesting. Um, okay, yeah, 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 sure, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I was thinking of something that's maybe you know. Uh, yeah, okay, that that that. Yeah, fair enough. That works. Yeah. Okay, so there is another question. Uh, uh, does it mess anything up to not handle the case where one side has terminated? Especially, uh, example, if uh, bold is lambda uh, through maybe this is okay. Uh, I think there's some. Um, uh, Alex, can you explain that uh, yourself? But I'm not sure if I understand the syntax. Yeah, sorry. I, I was wondering in the interpreter now, we are uh, not handling the case where one of the parallel computations has terminated in a special way. Um, and before that would have led to a divergent comp computation if, uh, if, lim if bools were like the constant true function. And I'm wondering if we're just putting that in the divergence effect now. Um, if both computations have, have, have uh, that, you, you're, you're right. Yes, we are doing that here. Um, so uh, probably in my attempt to simplify this, I, uh, you know, I, I stuck that in, into the divergence effect, but uh, I should probably follow the structure of the part of a bit more closely. You're right. Okay. Um, yeah. So there is, I think. Uh, yeah, I think those are. I think there's a common. Uh, we can't you return uh, DV of lemma false, which I think you mentioned. Uh, yeah, you you can you can return um, uh, you can return uh, in inside DV you can return false by just you know uh, looping. Uh, so in this, so what I'm. What I've done here is, I, you know, I'm taking the definition of my interpreter to be the specification. That uh, you know, so this is a definitional interpreter. This is what it means to run programs. So if this if this if this interpreter diverges, then then indeed all your programs will diverge. So the, the definition of this interpreter is part of the spec. Okay. Uh, and there's, I think it's about the same topic. So. I wonder if we can do the same thing easily in Cock. Uh, would there be any overhead? So I think you. So I, I think it would be hard to do this partial correctness semantics in Cock because Cock does not have this DB effect. 
Uh, you could do this, you could do a total correctness version of this in COC, uh, the one that I showed you part out. I think this should be doable in COC, although um, I'm not, so I, I think I, it, the reason this part out works fairly smoothly in F star is a lot because of uh, um, uh, extensional type theory at work. A lot of the conversions are happening very silently in the background. And if you were to do this in COC, I think you would have to deal a lot with um, coercions, equality coercions. And this may, this may be painful. Okay. Yeah. Uh, those, those are the questions. So now, uh, so I'm, I'm now I've done everything with respect to this kind of generic separation logic, right? I've very I've made a very very few assumptions about a separation logic. I just need star to be uh, a uh, commutative monoid, and uh, so now I can instantiate the separation logic with a a um, uh, inst instantiate this type class with a separation logic that I'm actually interested in. So. Um, I haven't in this demo. I haven't bothered to go and give you a full-on heap model. I'm just going to assume that I have a heap model of of this form, and I'm, uh, that I have some type of heaps. I have some type of uh, assertions and a star, and I'm going to say this thing is a, com a commutative monoid. So I can continue my demo. And once I have that, I can package up this this uh, uh, my effect M as my 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 uh, monad M as an effect in F star by uh, using this. Uh, um, this gadget that you've seen before. Okay, uh, and now I, I have uh, I and I, I still have those uh, the technicalities that I showed you earlier. Some way to lift pure uh, and in this case divergent code to my uh, new effect. Um, but once I've uh, once I assume that I you know once I have that and I can uh, and I take some types of uh, references and points to assertions and so on. Um, I can start, you know, so, so I'm, I'm assuming that I have a heap model. Now, if you go look at our papers, we will actually give you a, a, a concrete heap model. Here, I'm just assuming I have one, okay? Uh, so um, once I have those things, I can actually uh, define imperative actions where um, uh, to implement a bang, I can define an action based off of, a, uh, off of my uh, heap model. I have some total function to read a value from a heap. Um, I can package that as an effect uh, bang. Um, I can uh, with with the type that you um, that you expect. So it says if I initially have x pointing to b zero, then uh, I'm the value returned by this computation is going to be some b. I still get that x points to b zero, but I have a, a pure property on the side that tells me the value that was returned b is actually equal to this value, this ghost value that I that was my uh, initial assertion. Okay, and uh, I can build similar specifications for assignment. I can even build a combinator for frame, and I can build a combinator for par. So here's how I can actually do parallel computations overseas. Um, so if I have two, an F0 and F1, and they are uh, both in this, in this C effect, transforming P0 to Q0 and P1 to Q1, I can compose them by parallelly by reifying them to their representations. Now I have their trees. And then uh, given that trees, I can build one of these par nodes in the tree. And then I can reflect this par node of the tree back into my effect. And then I get my uh, a parallel composition on my effect. Um, I can start to write small programs, like here's a program to increment a, a, a reference. And then I can actually write programs to increment reference in, references in parallel. So if I'm given this incur, if I want to incur two references in parallel, I can use the par combinator passing in two closures to increment the two references. And then I go from X0, B0, X1, B1 in parallel to um, the increment of X0 and B1. Okay. So that's kind of, you know, in a nutshell, like uh, in, a, in, a, in a very reduced uh, setting, like how steel core builds a shallow embedding of separation logic for dependently typed F star. Um, notice that in order to do these proofs so, so far, like, this is, you know, this is um, uh, the proofs about even simple things like incur here in my small demo are like are still super manual. Like I had to apply a frame by hand, I explicitly apply a rewriting and so on to get the specs that I want. So um, what we do then is uh, uh, having built the steel core semantics, 
this the the second paper this uh, that's on the that's linked on the course notes that's the steel paper is showing how from this semantics you can build proof automation tools in fstar using tactics and uh, unification and smt solving and so on a, a, a suite of proof automation techniques that then let you write programs in the style that you want let you write the swap that i showed you in the beginning that uh, without these kinds of um, uh, uh, manual proofs for framing and so on. So that's kind of what the second paper is about, how to, how to automate proofs. Um, I have about 10 minutes left and I was going to show you, I had promised to show on the chat a little bit about how you can do message passing on top of all of this. So maybe in about two, three minutes, I'll give you a quick flavor of, of message passing and then I'll stop and take questions. Um, so based on top of all this stuff, on, on, uh, as I said in the beginning, um, separation logic is a, is a logic of, of resources. These can be heaps, but they can be, uh, they can be other things like uh, channels on which you can exchange messages. And so what, one of the things we've done in, in Steel is to build a library that um, based on the Steel core separation logic, we build a library of typed channels. In fact, these are session typed channels, channels on which you can associate small protocols that describe how you're supposed to communicate on those channels. So, um, so for instance, we have, uh, uh, there's, um, you can, uh, I'll show you in a minute how this works. There's, there's a, you can associate a protocol with a channel, P, and, um, and then you can create a new channel and say, if you just describe a protocol, the protocol can be something like, first send me an integer, and then I can expect to receive an integer that's greater than the integer that I sent previously. And then, um, you know, so you can describe this kind of little interaction, this uh, a protocol of how the commu communication is supposed to happen on the channel as a state machine. And um, once you allocate a channel, you can get two endpoints for that channel. And, um, and then you can use the channel to send messages across, um, uh, across the channel to the two endpoints with specifications in this separation logic. So, um, the kind of thing that that allows you to do is a, a very um, is a, a very small demo. So it says so. Here's a, a, a kind of a, a, a protocol that you can describe. I can de describe a little ping pong protocol in a um, in a uh, in a data type of protocols in that's embedded in FSTAR. So here's here's another example of an embedded sub language in FSTAR. So my language of protocols is going to be my first message in the protocol is going to be send an integer. And if I send an in integer and, the, and uh, the, the result of that, the, the integer that I sent was X, then the next action in, in my protocol is to, be, is to receive an integer. And I can give that the type of the value that's gonna be received a refinement type. I, say, I can say the next message to be received is going to be an integer and whatever integer it is, it's gonna be Y, but it must be greater than the integer that I sent first. So this is gonna force the other side of the endpoint uh, the other endpoint to reply with an integer that's greater than the integer that I that that I sent initially, and then the protocol ends. So it's a little simple two-message state machine. I can describe such a protocol, and then I can I can write a client of this of this protocol that's going to given one of these a channel that's indexed by this ping pong protocol. What I can do first is to send seventeen on the channel because the first action on the protocol is to send, and then I can block waiting for a receive. Here's another reason why I need divergence in my semantics. I'm going to block waiting for a receive. And if the, the other endpoint just goes away, this is going to block forever. Okay, so, so uh, non-termination is really the core part of, what, of these kinds of programs. So, um, so I'm going to block waiting for a Y. And if I get a Y, I, I can prove here that the Y that I get must be greater than 17 because the type of the protocol tells me that the other endpoint is going to reply a well-typed endpoint on the other side is going to reply with uh, some value greater than the value that I sent to it. Um, uh, uh, and uh, dually, if I receive on the other side as a server, let's say, if I receive a message on this channel, Y, I must try to send something greater than Y. If I try to send something like, if I try to reply with Y itself, uh, F star will complain saying, um, uh, uh, sorry, I have a demo of that here. So it says uh, here, if I um, if I say try to send a, a, a value that is uh, smaller than y, uh, FSTAR will complain saying, you know, I expected a message that was suitable for this next step of the protocol, but you gave me a message that was not. 
So this forces the server to also respect the protocol. Um, and because all of this is parallel, I can, I can do things like I can create a new channel, spawn two threads, that's the par, and run client and server in each thread and, um, and, and wait till they and wait for them to join. Wait for and this is like once they return, I, I release the channels by just uh, dropping all these permissions. Uh, I can also do things like you know spawn n threads. So this is a way to say I can I can write comp now I'm I'm in full F star right. So I, I if I I can write all kinds of combinators that I want. So um, join all is a way and and many is a way to to spawn n threads and um, and then to wait for all of them to terminate and by joining them all. And now I'm because I'm in just dependently typed F star I can program all these libraries uh, as as I like. So. Um, that's uh, so. Let me stop there uh, and uh, have, I guess, five minutes and then a break for some questions. Uh, but well, maybe before I stop, I just 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 to wrap. This is the last my, my the last course, last lecture. So I just leave you with some kind of parting remarks. So I, I, yeah, throughout this course, I think the main message I've wanted to convey to you is that if you're working in a proof assistant that is sufficiently expressive, that's like a dependently type proof assistant, you can use the power of this logic to encode programming disciplines of your choice. And by embedding them carefully inside the proof system in a way that you can, you can do this in a way so that, so that the embedded languages that you're working with come with tools um, and structures that allow you to prove interesting properties about your embedded languages in an abstraction suitable for that embedded language. And I think that's kind of the, 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 the main idea I want you to take away from this course is that, you know, um, uh, to think about how best to embed the languages that you you are all working on now and are going to you know as uh, the the future of our PL community you're going to des design new languages uh, uh, in the uh, you know as part of your 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 PhDs and your careers you know I, I encourage you to think about like how you can take take full fledged realistic languages and give them semantics inside a framework that is expressive enough to um, to describe, you know, nearly, you know, uh, to, to, to describe the semantics of kind of rich, um, uh, non-trivial programming constructs that you want to write realistic programs, including concurrency and asynchrony and distribution and so on. And I think dependently type, type proof assistants are the place in which to do this, this kind of thing, F star being one of them. And um, but I think many of the lessons that I've that I've uh, tried to convey, I think, uh, would apply equally with different trade-offs to um, uh, other proof assistants that, that, that you're all familiar with already. So that's, that's kind of my main message. Um, thank you for uh, you know, uh, sticking with this course through uh, Zoom and the long, uh, 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 long remote sessions in strange time zones. Uh, um, so um, I've, I've appreciated um, being able to tell you all about this. So we have some time for questions, I guess. I have a question about the channel. Actually, first of all, thanks. It was a uh, it was really fun sticking around and uh, learning about a star. Um, so about, about the channel types, uh, you showed a fairly, I guess, simple case where we're just sending and receiving ints, and there's a refinement that you can add on top of it. Mm -hmm. um, does it have high order? properties does can you send uh channels over for example so um uh so you can't send channel in in the language that i showed you you, you cannot send channels over channels uh but um uh we you can encode this uh because um uh, you know be, because you're in, in a a dependently type setting you can encode uh sending permissions across uh, across uh, you know, essentially, what you want to be able to do is to say, "I have permission to use a channel." That's some some separation logic assertion, and I'm going to give you that permission by sending you a message uh, across some channel. And I'm not actually going to transmit a channel physically to you. I'm just going to transmit permission to you to use that channel. So you can encode this in F star because you can, you know, you know, I, I can, I can, um, uh, I can describe a language of of codes that describe the, the set of permissions that I have that I want to exchange over a channel. And instead of sending you the, a, 
the permission, I'm going to send you a code for the permission. And you can, and we can, we can agree to interpret those codes in a certain way that correspond to the, the permissions. So you can encode this um, uh, using uh, dependently typed generic programming. I see. Uh, Nikhil, could you stop sharing, please? Oh, yeah. Okay, well, thank you again. Let's give him a round of applause. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. Since we cannot give you the certificate in person. Thank you. Okay. And as I said, we will have some t-shirt ready and uh, I'm sure that uh, we will see you again in Eugene. So you will get your new t-shirt. Thank you so much, Zena. And thank you, Jim and everybody. It's, uh, it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, no, I think that this is working out pretty well, actually. I'm, I'm, I'm surprised I was waiting for some disaster to happen, but <laughs> everything is smooth. So thank you again. Thank you. What, what is the um, uh, what's the the furthest time zone um, that we that we have people at right now? Is it somewhere in there in the middle of the night? Oh, they went to sleep, I guess. I guess so. <laughs> They're already sleeping. Yeah. Yeah. Seven thirty. Okay. Seven. Yeah. Um. I think the people from India and China are probably watching the recordings rather than being here live. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's uh... <clears throat> okay. Enjoy the rest of the afternoon, Nikhil, and uh, see you around. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um...